turn it to now. Oh, there we go. Now, of course, to me, I sound um, incredibly loud, but I'm assuming that out there it, it sounds just as it ought to. Um, the best part, really, about having this early on a Friday evening is that you can catch a double feature. You can leave here and go see, for instance, First Man. So you can get a double feature of military history um, before the evening is out. And so if you're looking for something uh, to continue the excitement of your early evening, that may be an option. Um, as, um, as was stated earlier, um, the influence of women at war cannot truly be overstated. Okay. But that's a huge topic. And so I decided that for this evening, I would confine my formal remarks to women in World War II. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't have a discussion uh, about women before or women after. It was just a way to try to find a right and left limit for coherence. So once we're done here, uh, don't feel that your question doesn't fit the topic because that's simply not the case. Okay. Also, as mentioned earlier, Officially, in the United States, women were um, enrolled in military service uh, during World War I. Officially, except that there was no benefit coverage for them after they left the service. Many of the women who we think of as serving in World War I also served really on a, um, uh, almost like a contractor. You know, so they went places like Europe to serve as telephone operators, and they did wear uniforms, but they were not necessarily part of the military. Uh, they, were, um, they were of the military, but not part of it. So the history of women in World War I, we tend to um, oversimplify when actually it was a very complicated, uh, multi-layered sort of service. Regardless, we can count about 34,000 women who enlisted in the military in World War I. Now, that's not a huge number compared to those, those women who serve now. <clears throat> but if you stop and think about the size of the military in 2018 and recognize that overall, officer and enlisted, that women comprise only 15% of the military, they still are not um, that uh, dominant in military service. Regardless, their presence in the military does make a difference, and that was recognized in 2016 when all combat arms were opened to women. That's not, uh, that, that was surprised people, uh, I think, some people, but it really shouldn't have because ultimately whenever women have been in the military, whenever women have been exposed to war across history, they have been fighters. Officially or unofficially, they have also been responsible for picking up whatever weapons were available to them in that historical period and frequently uh, took on the same task as their male military counterparts. That's just the reality of the way war works. Typic uh, officially, as far as governments, once we had state governments were concerned, uh, they were uh, auxiliaries not in the way we think of auxiliaries, which still have a kind of official position, but they um, worked as 
laundry women. They worked as cooks. They married themselves to the army quite literally. They would follow the army with their uh, husband. They might follow the army with their father. Maybe mom had already died. But women who attached themselves to the military felt themselves as much a part of the military as the man who officially was enrolled in the ranks. So that sense of connection that women uh, recall now from their own service, that World War I female veterans, that World War II female veterans um, have been particularly likely to express when they are interviewed. That's not, that's not new to them. For, for women, just as for men, that military service, that experience with war may be that defining point in their lives. That's that definition, that, that high mark, that watermark in life has no gender specificity. It, there's not a gender line there. War is a profound experience and women come away with many of the same attitudes, using many of the same phrases that men do when they describe their experience. At the same time, those women will come away and say, here's what's special about serving in the military as a woman. And part of that comes from that resistance, uh, that initial resistance to enlist women officially into the military. You see that chink in the U.S. military. You see the chink begin to open with World War I, but it doesn't expand until World War II. And even then, for most people, the military is decidedly a man's world. The joke about your mother wears, wears combat boots really was intended as an insult because the suggestion was that she had shed her femininity, right? And that she could never regain it. It was gone. Or that, in fact, she had never held femininity but was a lesbian. So the idea of serving in the military in World War I and World War II had uh, ramifications that it didn't have for men. For instance, just getting permission to serve officially was uh, a long and difficult process. But once they began to serve, those problems, those difficulties, the difference in service for women remained obvious throughout their service. Uh, one of the audience this evening, Mr. Hitt, brought a um, uh, albums that his mother had kept from her time as a wave during World War II. And it's a fascinating collection of documents because one of the things that military women of this era and in through the 60s and the 70s uh, complained about was the, you know, the, the restricting um, requirements of their uniforms. Okay. Um, they had their undergarments assigned to them. Everybody wore a girdle whether they needed one or not. It didn't matter what time of year it was, you wore stockings. So there's an attempt really to regulate for women in the military what femininity is. And there's also an, an intense uh, desire officially to make sure that women are understood as still being feminine despite having uh, signed up to serve in the military. And that sounds odd to us today, but it's a sign of the influence 
that particularly women in World War II, perhaps you or your parents or your grandparents, those women had a profound effect on what it is that uh, women can do and in some respects some of the uh, social pushback um, for what women can do. Those, those pieces of, of what it means to be a woman um, reside yet in American society. But it's, it's these women who have said, I can serve too. Um, I have an obligation as a good American, as a patriot, to serve my country in the same way that a man serves. Okay. Now, admittedly, they, women still don't have to register for the draft. That may change. Uh, that's another discussion, uh, probably a very unhappy one for most people. But it's, it's to begin, I, th I think, the really smart starting point for talking about women in the United States military is with World War II. Now there were, during stepping back a moment, some of the disadvantages of having women serve in uh, World War I as auxiliaries hung with um, the, the services. There was a recognition that, yeah, okay, in times of a really big war, we're probably going to have to have women serve. We don't like it. We're going to keep it to a minimum. Um, but ultimately, we anticipate that we will have to do that. During the interwar years, those years between World War I and World War II, the services made it very difficult for in, uh, difficult to um, approve women serving in the military should there be a manpower need uh, in another war. They knew that it was likely to happen, but they were still resistant to uh, establish an official policy. It was, it was like, well, if we don't uh, address this, maybe no one will make us do it. Okay. We, we know there are problems with it, but if we just pretend that women have never served and that we're not going to have to do this again, maybe it won't happen. A good example, uh, maybe the best example, of how uncomfortable the United States was with the idea of women serving in the military uh, occurred in 1925. Now, during World War I, the Navy used wording in the Naval Reserve Act of 1916 to justify enlisting women because the 1916 version of the act allowed citizens to enlist. So the Navy got around uh, enlisting yeomen, or yeomanettes uh, was, uh, was their nickname. Uh, they were actually considered just yeoman women by the, by the service, but that there has to be a diminutive associated with their service. So they became something smaller than a yeoman. They became yeomanettes in popular parlance. But in 1925, Congress changed the wording of the, the, Res the Reserve Act to say male citizens. That is a very pointed way of saying we don't want the individual services to take this issue into their own hands. We're reserving um, that permission to the government. We are the ones who will make that decision. So when the United States mobilized for World War II, the Navy Department required congressional permission to enlist women. During the interwar period, the Army sincerely 
struggled. Or maybe it was really insincerely struggled <laughs> with how um, to deal with the potential need for women in the military. They did, they being the Army, they did sincerely reject two proposals regarding the use of women in the event of another war. The first proposal was developed by Anita Phipps. Now, Phipps occupied a truly little-known position as the Director of Women's Relations within the Army. And she was shoved well into the bowels of the War Department um, and all of these little nagging questions about women fell on her desk. She didn't get a lot of hearing uh, for much of anything, but this was probably the biggest issue, so that's, where we, that's why we hear her name. After a careful study of the American, uh, American and British experiences during the Great War, in 1926, FIP wrote a detailed plan proposing that women be in the Army rather than serve as an auxiliary. That phrasing is profoundly important. She is proposing that they actually enlist officially in the Army, and her suggestion is that based on this being in the army, that she would have all of the obligations, but also all of the rights and services that went with that commitment to serving in the military. There were almost immediate re objections to Phipps' proposal, um, as many as they could imagine. It was going to be very costly to have women in the military. It was going to cause transportation difficulties because you didn't want female soldiers to be on the same buses or trains as you wanted male soldiers. Yeah, so there needed to be segregation. We talk, when we think of segregation in the services, we think of uh, racial segregation. But there's also, in this early period, real fear of having the men and the women too close to each other. Um, part of that comes from that um, idea that somehow women are there to support the Army, as was suggested earlier. And they were sincerely concerned about toilet facilities. They uh, worried about what it would cost to build toilet facilities that would be appropriate to women, that would not be too bare for women. Uh, you know, a shower and a toilet, that wasn't, with tile on the wall, simply wasn't appropriate. I mean, these are women we're talking about, and they are not accustomed to dealing with these sorts of deprivations. Of course, keep in mind that the women who are going to enlist in the services come from the same socioeconomic backgrounds and cultural experiences as the men who serve. Many of these women work hard in factories. Many of these women work hard on the farm. They're not all pampered sitting at home crocheting or embroidering and um, reading books all day. These women are working, uh, and for those of you who grew up on farms or have parents who worked in factories or have had that experience yourself, you know that there is, that that is not girl work, right? That's not ladies' work. But this is, this is a, a something that really occupied the minds mostly of the men but certainly of women as well. Because whatever period of history you are in, there are women who will push boundaries and women who are content with the boundaries that have been set for them. Neither is, is more acceptable than the other. 
It's just how it works. But realistically, it is mostly the men who are concerned about the niceties uh, of women serving in the military. The most revealing objection, however, came from an assistant chief of staff, uh, Brigadier General Campbell King. And King wrote that Phipps, Phipps' plan uh, threatened to create a woman-dominated organization, keyword dominate, right, um, dominated organization that would prove a powerful machine, difficult to control, <laughs> and endowed with possibilities of hampering and embarrassing the War Department. Now keep in mind that at this point uh, in that interwar period, this is uh, a place where the military is a place where judges would uh, look at juvenile delinquents or young offenders and say, okay, well, you, you can choose. You can go to the Army or you can go uh, to detention or you can go to jail for a year. All right. But somehow having women um, would, would embarrass the War Department. Now, I know that I am uh, being um, a little flip about this. And don't misunderstand me, because this is the time. This is the way people understood things. But even at the time, there were people standing back doing a Macaulay Culkin, thinking, really? These are the worries that the military uh, find most difficult when it comes to thinking about manpower shortages in the next war. And of course, as you know, the closer we get to World War II, uh, the more that there is an understanding that manpower is going to be a problem. Right. But this is, this is, these are real concerns. These truly frustrated many women and even more men as they're trying to figure out how to make this work uh, when the time comes. Now, two years later, the Army appointed. So first we have Anita Phipps, and her plan is rejected. So two years later, they assign a male to come up with a, a, the proper plan for integrating women. Um, it, was a, it was important enough to give to an army major. Okay. Um, for those of you who have served, which probably most of you in here, you know that an 04 is the guy to solve, or the woman at this point, to solve all of the big problems for the military. So it suggests to you then also just how much um, interest they had in this particular, this looming issue. So it's a Major Everett Hughes, became the chief army planner for a women's corps. Now Hughes didn't think that the army could fully plan its new requirements until it knew what its new requirements were going to be. And that's reasonable. We all have to have some sort of base assessment or some sort of base assumption about what we're going to require for what we now call FUOPs, future operations. But nevertheless, he is required to develop a program uh, suitable for the military. Now, he contended that women could and should be part of the regular army. So he proposes this in 1927, and it is shelved immediately. Right? Because it is, in many ways, much more radical than what the woman had proposed. Right? Yes, we're going to need women, and they should fully be part of the army. Until 1931, 
excuse me, it was shelved uh, very quickly, and it was a, an, an added note in 1931. There was a note added that may as well suspend as no one seems willing to do anything about it. There is, and this is, some of this is resistance. Some of this is resistance to women having these positions, and some of it is just a failure in pre-war planning. Uh, it's a misunderstanding in some instances of what kind of manpower needs there actually will be. And if you're not convinced as an organization that you're going to need women and that if you do have to take them in, then you want to keep those numbers small because there are these horrible, horrible problems like buses and trains then it's, it's much easier to ignore. And there is a third plan. This one was developed at the request of Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall. And now the plan developed at his request eventually became the model for mobilizing women during World War II. And the study was also built around the argument that women were not to be given military status. Okay. So everybody gets kind of excited when they, when they hear George C. Marshall said, hey, we need a plan for this. And then you read a little bit farther and it says, yeah, we're going to have to have women, but they're not going to be given uh, regular status. Uh, and it also suggested that the next women's auxiliary be modeled on the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, for those of you who may not have heard of the Civilian Conservation Corps, it's, a, uh, it's one of the agencies developed during the Depression um, by uh, um, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, to find um, employment for um, the unemployed and it was focused on men and the idea was that they can have uh, it, it'll be sort of communal living they'll they'll live in a barracks type they'll be fed uh, they get a small amount of pay and that they will supplement needs for instance of the Forest Service so if there's a place where trees need to be planted then you, you send out the Civilian Conservation Corps. That's one of the examples. For anybody who's visited perhaps Vicksburg Battlefield in Mississippi, uh, that battlefield was changed dramatically during the Depression because they sent the Civilian Conservation Corps out to plant trees. They wanted to make it prettier. Uh, they also misunderstood thinking that this area was much more treed during the Civil War than it actually was. So, but they, this, these are the kinds of jobs that they were given and the way that they were attached to the government. We're going to use you, but you're really not going to be of us. And there won't be any benefits, any awards, any honors that will follow you out as you go back into your regular civilian life. So this is what George C. Marshall had envisioned. But even that plan uh, rested without much um, examination, essentially dormant for the next 18 months. The Army addressed the question of women in uniform only after Congressman Edith Norse Rogers pushed the issue. Uh, Norse Rogers was uh, the first woman elected to the House of Representatives from Massachusetts, and she was intensely interested in veterans and military affairs. So she is set apart for two reasons. She is a woman representative, the first one from her state, and her interest is in veterans and military affairs. And you may also recognize that name 
um, as the sponsor of the GI Bill for World War II uh, veterans. In addition, Rogers was the driving force behind congressional approval of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Remember, the original idea that everyone is pushing is they're not really going to be in the Army, they're going to be an auxiliary. So women who um, enrolled in the Army, who enlisted in the Army early on, were WAACs. And even for that, even for the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, the debate was rancorous and time-consuming. These are for auxiliaries. And yet, there's a great deal of discomfort, a great deal of opposition. Representatives feared that the intent was to send women into combat. That piece of the military um, uh, requirement has been always uh, the, one of the greatest fears of governing organizations. Women don't belong in combat for all sorts of reasons. And some of it is fear for women. There's, there's a desire to protect women and the future of the country. Uh, sometimes it's because they don't think women can do it. But this is, this is the argument that if you do this, this is one step closer to putting your, your mothers and your sisters into, no kidding, combat boots. So there's a great deal of pushback from men about that. And in part also because, and we continue to hear this, even though women have now been, um, women can now serve in all the combat arms, you still hear worries about, from opponents, and in fact, even from some people who are working hard to make it, to make it actually work, that there will be men who um, are more inclined to protect their female fellow fighter than they are to um, fight the enemy. And that debate, that debate continues. Now the Army's action and opposition from her male colleagues um, convinced Rogers that that was the best she could do at the time, the auxiliary. So she didn't push it much farther at, at that moment. She knew it was going to have to change, but this was the best she could do. She could get a foot in the door, and so she, she took what she could get. Despite her interest and Marshall's support, it still took months before the Army and Congress acted. Despite the Pearl Harbor attack, despite manpower shortages that threatened to derail plans for the invasion of North Africa, Congress dragged its collective feet in approving women serving in uniform. Now, although the Senate had passed the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, that WAAC bill, fairly quickly, um, that's the Senate, the House was uh, particularly difficult. And it was a badly flawed bill passed in 1942, in the spring of 1942. But nevertheless, as I said, this is the best that Norris Rogers thought she would be able to manage. Under the bill's provisions, Women who volunteered for the Army enlisted in an auxiliary rather than the regular Army, which means that women didn't have military status, although the WAC was administered by the Army. The Army doesn't really want to administer a WAC, but if it doesn't administer the WAC itself, then what kind of female-dominated uh, uh, 
decisions will be made for the auxiliary. Ideally, there's no auxiliary, there's no women to deal with. Now, most WACs didn't realize that when they enlisted that they were not legally bound to remain in service. They're not in the Army. So it's an auxiliary. In fact, a woman could walk away from the auxiliary at any time she chose with virtually no ram uh, um, negative ramifications. Okay. So if you're going to have an auxiliary, now you don't really want to know, you don't really want people to know that they can walk away from it if they're unhappy with it. So there's all sorts of contradictory thoughts about should we have one, what should it be like, who gets to administer it. We don't really want them, but we don't want them to not want us. Uh, we don't want them to tell us we're not doing this right by simply getting up and walking away. So they, th that part was just not mentioned when women signed uh, to join. So, as, so without status as a direct part of the Army, the WACs sent overseas during World War II still lacked the legal protections given to male soldiers. That means they are also going to lack the benefits male soldiers will have when they come home. And these inequities ultimately posed real problems for uh, recruiting women because the other services, women in the other services had full military status. So once WACs uh, began to understand, WAACs, once they began to understand that, hmm, there's a choice I can make, then the Navy and the uh, Marine Corps or the Coast Guard became much more attractive to them. If I'm going to do my duty, then I should be re, um, rewarded for doing what I understand as my patriotic duty. By 1943, the WAC faced a personnel Congress that, excuse me, a personnel crisis that forced Congress to establish the Women's Army Corps what we know as the WAC, right? the WAC. And that provided women in the Army the same protections and benefits uh, enjoyed by women in the other services. The WAC bill, and in case you are interested, I'm not going to test you, uh, but Public Law 554-77 uh, Congress passed in uh, May, gave women that status. It, they also chose their first, they being the Army, oh, this is important. I, I apologize, we're stepping backward for just a moment, okay? Um, this is one of the primary speeches, this is an excerpt from one of the primary speeches against women, against the Women's Army Corps. So they're really worried that uh, these, these male congressmen and people who are writing in, of course, are really concerned about who then will do the mending if women join the services. Um, who, nobody will know how to cook. And if they know how to do these things, once they join the service, because they're going to lose their femininity, and beyond that, not just their femininity, but, but lose their womanliness, right, that they will then be unsuitable to return to civilian life. Think of the humiliation. What will this do to the manhood of, of America if they have to learn how to sew on their own buttons? Re regardless the fact that if you're serving in the military, you're going to have to learn how to sew on your own button. 
So there is a part of Congress that, while representing many of the concerns that the public had, there's also some arguments coming out of Congress that show it is clearly out of touch with what it means to serve in the military, even for men. Okay. So my apologies for, for the back step, but I, I, we had to talk about this. Oh, sure. Um, this is from a speech in the House, and it says, take the women into the armed service. Who then will do the cooking, the washing, the mending, the humble, homey tasks to which every woman has devoted herself? Think of the humiliation. What has become of the manhood of America? Okay. Now, this is... Um, a standard, I mean, this, this attitude about women and what they actually do is, quite frankly, an, an upper-class conception of what women do. They're at home doing all of these things so that their men will come home to a tidy house and a, and a lovely, beautifully prepared home-cooked meal, but the reality is, is that outside of that middle, uh, that the majority of Americans, outside of the middle and upper classes, women have to work in some fashion. And they have had since the beginning of uh, American uh, society. So, uh, and, the, and the same thing is true everywhere else in the world. So this is, this is a very um, sheltered, uh, a, ver a, a real misconception about what it is that women do. So anyway, I, I apologize for stepping backwards. But at any rate, once they have, once PL 544 has passed, you have to go about finding a director. And the military is particularly concerned about finding the right directors. So they for the Army, it's Oveda Culp Hobby. Um, she is active in Texas politics. She is married to a former governor of Texas. She has two children. She's a media executive. Uh, she has a publishing background and a law degree. Okay. So not just anybody. If you're going to start a women's service, you have to find the right director. And they also gave women the opportunity, those who were in the WAAC, the opportunity to leave or to join the WAC. So the Army has a serious problem with growing pains. The Navy is not acting as quickly. They're watching what the Army is doing. And um, they watched and learned. So they determined that they would take women into the Navy, and they would have Lieutenant Commander Mildred McAfee. She's the highest ranking Navy woman. That's the highest rank any woman in the Navy can attain at that time. Uh, for those of you um, who are not familiar with military ranks, uh, that's the same as an Army major. So an O4, mid-level uh, military officer. To get this permission for there to be uh, women in the Navy, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt had to intercede. And it was approved in July 42. So member of the Navy Women's Marine, excuse me, Women's Reserve were called WAVES because it made a better acronym. Women accepted for volunteer service. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not joking. It made a better acronym than Navy Women's Reserves. You could just say I'm a WAVE. The same law provided for women Marines. And in keeping with the tradition that every Marine is a Marine, women Marines were spared awkward and, by today's standards, chauvinistic acronyms. They were and continue to be called women Marines 
or WM? What they are. So no, the, the Marines never looked for um, a kind of, you know, feminine acronym. And a few months later, the Coast Guard also began enlisting women. All of the services struggled with integrating, with administering the women's components. And um, during crises, the regular forces struggled with the cadre needed to train and to administer the flood of volunteers. Now, this remains essentially the model. Um, however, what uh, ever lessons we learned from World War I, from uh, World War II, from Vietnam, um, we quickly forget. And each new war, uh, you have to learn all of these pieces over again. The, na the, the military, the army, the, milita the military generally, but the army in particular, really anticipated that it was going to be able to um, enlist a million women. They had a ceiling of 1.5 million. Their goal was 63,000. They never got close to that enrollment. Some of that is that women um, prefer to stay in their roles at home. Uh, some of it had to do with women preferring to serve in services other than the Army. And some of it uh, had to do with um, just bad recruiting, right? Um, are you recruiting to women's patriotism or are you, as suggested, you can still be a girl and serve in the Marines. You can still be a girl and uh, serve in the Army. And I, I think that missed the mark, right? The, the idea was be a proud American citizen and join the service and because that's what drew the women who did join. Right? It's not about, oh, I'm not going to stop being female. It's about I have a duty to serve. That's certainly the reason my mother, a WM, opted to serve in the military. Now, once the services established the components, they had to recruit and train them, and they turned largely to uh, women's colleges. They had the facilities. Uh, they were isolated, for the most part, from interference uh, from male recruits nearby. And... Um, it made sense. You also had these educated women who could be uh, enticed to become officers in the military. Despite all of the precautions to protect the women who enlisted, there was a great deal of popular disapproval. Um, women in the military were sluts or they had abnormal sexual proclivities. Verbal attacks became so common and so vile that in 1943, the president, first lady, the service secretaries, the commandant of the Marine Corps and General Marshall launched an investigation thinking that surely this has to be enemy propaganda. And it turned out that this nastiness was coming from serving male soldiers or male veterans from World War I. So this is that personal experience of serving as a woman in the military. 
that, that men d cannot uh, necessarily relate to, uh, at least not the majority of men. This nastiness, this, this hatred that, came, that comes at you uh, because you don't meet a particular standard. Women served in all theaters. They served in Europe, the Middle East, China, Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia, China, Burma, India. Um, generally, they sent only the best they had, only the best women they had. And those women performed well, despite the harassment and despite sometimes being um, forced into what are what seemed very much like to the women um, affected uh, to internment camps. For instance, in Australia, they were determined to keep the Aussies away from American women and determined to keep American men away from American women. So every night they had to go into a fenced uh, barracks area. They had a curfew, and that was that was that. So there was it was miserable duty because there's no opportunity for any kind of entertainment. I mean, you couldn't even get out and go to a movie um, on your own. And then, of course, we are familiar with those women who were taken prisoner by the Japanese nurses, primarily who were taken prisoner by the Japanese. Until late 1944, uh, legal restrictions uh, prevented women from the sea services um, serving outside the continental United States. So most of the women who served, as, as I would say, as I was suggesting, most of the women who had service outside what we call CONUS uh, would have been um, Army rather than the other services. At the end of the war, the war, uh, the, the military services ended the military, the women's military components. They just uh, demobilized them faster than um, they demobilized the, the male components. And there was a push on to demobilize as quickly as possible. Um, General Eisenhower was not the only one, but perhaps the most prominent military figure who thought that the women's military uh, services should be permanent. The directors, those women I showed you earlier, were not among them. Personally, they had interrupted their lives and were doing a service during a time of crisis. So, they really didn't see the need for them. And ultimately, recognizing that not all women felt that way about their service, they declined to involve themselves over the debate about the Women's Armed Services Act. That was passed on 2 June 1948. President Truman signed it 10 days later. And the restrictions on the numbers ranks private life and specialties of service women. Um, despite those, the, that act confirmed that the United States recognized that women in the military were valuable and that it could not, it could not any longer anticipate fighting wars without the official services of American women. And I am happy to take questions about World War II or about um, any uh, much broader questions if you, if you have them. Um, I, uh, I'm going to do like I do in class. I see a hand here and I saw a hand back here and, and one over there and then we'll start over. Okay? So, yes, sir. Oh, you can't really read that, can you? That's Colonel Ruth Cheney Streeter. Streeter, right. Uh, McAfee and Streeter were both academics. So again, they're looking to where they think they're going to find the most experienced administrators uh, and the most um, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for, uh, the most reliable, trustworthy women without, uh, without any sort of radical ideas. Sir, no, ma'am, and sir. But in the interwar period or between, uh, no, no. There were women who worked for the military um, in administrative positions like typists and that sort of thing, but nobody who actually wore a uniform or, or served the military. Uh, sir, and then up here, and then I thought I saw a hand over here somewhere, but. Yes. Yes, there's, there's a question about women who were taken prisoner by the Japanese and uh, whether or not they were treated differently. Uh, they were segregated. Um, there were definitely uh, abuses, some of them the same kinds of abuses that the male prisoners endured. Uh, there were more rapes of those women. Uh, there were certainly rapes of male prisoners, uh, but of course a woman, well nobody is going to come back from World War II as a prisoner and um, talk much about being raped. And quite frankly, if they did want to talk about it, the military would very quickly have hushed them up. Right? You don't want any, you don't want the, the manhood of America to be questioned and you certainly don't want to suggest that uh, the American military was not able to uh, prevent sexual assault of its female service members. Not that I'm aware. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but uh, the Japanese tended to subjugate those uh, to those people they had subjugated. They tended to just pull from uh, local populations. As far as I know of, there's no record of American women being used as comfort women. That, and so I cannot say definitively, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. Am I missing anyone over here? I don't want to miss. Okay. Um, there's a gentleman here and a gentleman there and one back there. Um, what, um, what is it actually you'd like me to tell you? How many there were, how they became? So there is the, the what we know as the WASP, the Women's Air Service Pilots. And um, what they did was they were, they were not part of the Air Force or, or of the Army Air Force. They were not part. They were actually volunteers. Uh, hot competition to be one of those women. And not only did they ferry aircraft, but they served as instructor pilots for the men who were going to uh, go into combat. Uh, there were several hundred women who died in the service uh, of their country just as these volunteer pilots. Some of them uh, were killed on training missions. Um, some of them died just because aircraft have problems and they hit the ground, um, mid-air collisions, not because they are messing up, but because of, um, um, an you know, a student hasn't quite figured it out yet. They've recently been given uh, that status, but throughout their service and up until the last few years, they were not recognized as part of uh, the military. Uh, sir, in the blue striped shirt, You mean official role in the Army Air Corps? 
Oh, I understand what you're saying. Yes, once they're in the service, obviously they're going to be put to work. Now, the idea, of course, in using women is that you free a man for combat, which is not altogether popular with all the men or all the men's wives, which is reasonable, right? I mean, if your man doesn't have to go into harm's way, then, then that's, that's a worry you don't have to deal with. But they do everything, essentially, that men do except go into combat. So if an aircraft needs to be repaired, if a tank needs repair, if they need drivers, if they, you know, if they need cooks, uh, if they need radio repairmen, uh, for instance, if it's, if it's any kind of job that a woman can fill, um, then a woman will fill that job because they need every able-bodied man to, to carry a rifle. Um, and back here and then back here, sir. All right. The Cadet Nurse Corps. Uh, there's not a lot written on them, not a lot out there that are literature that I'm aware of, and, and I'm not really a women's historian. I'm actually a Korean War historian. And so some of these pieces um, I don't know a lot about. Um, but I, the, they existed, and as he said, they were never a true part of the military, but it addressed also the nursing shortage that cropped up. So you don't even get, even with the, the women's, the Army Nurse Corps, even though it exists, oh, someone asked me whether women served in the interwar period. Yes, as nurses. I was thinking in terms of just being uniformed soldiers, but yes, as nurses. Uh, but even they experienced uh, manpower shortage and had to find a way to work around that. Yes, ma'am. I know the military was segregated from mm -hmm. Korea. So right. Are there any black or women of color units? Mm -hmm. um, the most famous is the, I think it's four sixes, the 66th, 66th Postal Battalion, I think is what it's called. But you don't, you, I mean, you don't want to have African American women do anything too important, right? It still needs to be considered fairly menial, right? So this is a segregated unit, all black women, and they have an absolutely stellar reputation for performance and conduct. And in fact, I am uncertain of the date. I don't know whether a, a firm date has been set, but they'll be installing a monument to that female African-American unit, unit at, um, at Fort Leavenworth within the next few months. I, I'm sorry, sir, I skipped you, I know. Um, the British acted faster, but there's still that idea that if you're, uh, if you're wearing a skirt, that you're there to entertain men. And in Great Britain, uh, it becomes, uh, there's, there's conflict because there's assumption that all of those Americans are taking good British girls. Uh, not even, and not only the ones in uniform, but are dating, you know, your sister um, or your cousin and all of those yanks are nothing but uh, lustful, um, um, unrestrained uh, men. And so that, that becomes a problem. And also, just in the British military, there's the same assumption. If you are a female in the military, well, there must be a secondary duty that nobody's talking about, right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, can you talk about benefits? Uh, you said at the beginning that women did have the same uh, benefits as men. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, absolutely. It changed. It changed in 1943 when they passed the bill that said there's no longer a WAAC, a Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, just the Women's Army Corps. So at that point, they're fully in the military and they are going to receive those same benefits. Um, to my knowledge, yes. Um, sir and sir, and I think that's probably the last question that we can take. Oh, good. So we have living proof or second generation proof. Excellent. Uh, sir. Right, women in the Asian theater, in the European theater. Right, well, the Asian theater is, uh, has a particular story because things were going so badly uh, for so long. Um, the European theater, there are women who die, uh, women who uh, are taken prisoner, but the numbers of women taking, taken prisoner are much, much, much smaller. Okay. Uh, but women die in road accidents. They die because they're taking on duties too close to the front, or sometimes the front moves, and the unit that they're working with doesn't know the front had moved. Uh-huh. Well, it has to do with the character of the war. The character of the war in Europe and the character of the war in Japan or are, are, uh, in Asia are two different things. Um, quite frankly, what you see going on in, in Asia is a race war. And it's, it's dirty and it's brutal and it's no holds barred. Uh, Dr. Curatola can talk to you about that more at length. Uh, one of his specialties is the war in the Pacific. Um, so may, if after um, we've ended here, he might he might be able to fill you in on on more more specific details. All right, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoy First Man.